Last time he was in Africa, New Zealand aid worker Tristan Clements barely escaped with his life. Now he's gone back to a place where several other foreigners have just been attacked and kidnapped. The world's poorest country, Niger. It's almost too cruel to imagine. A country that has endured five years of drought is hit by devastating flooding. Families have lost their homes. Crop harvests have been destroyed. And the spread of waterborne diseases like malaria has turned an already terrible situation into a humanitarian crisis. It's this emergency in Niger that has brought Tristan Clements back to Africa for the first time since he was ambushed in Darfur. It is at least a familiar territory. He ran World Vision's program here in 2005. But then Niger isn't without its own security issues. Did you have any reservations about coming back here? Uh, look, I had a couple of reservations, actually. I mean, there's been the kidnapping by um, Al-Qaeda operatives up in the north just last week. Um, and, and so you're aware that there are, there are risks, but you, you assess those risks and you understand the context and you, you make a decision and you, you say, well, actually, I realise that as an NGO worker, I'm not actually a high-profile target here, so I'm, I'm willing to, to come. Does it alter the way you think about things when you jump in a land cruiser and drive through the bush? I can't actually see a white land cruiser without thinking about the incident. Uh, it's the, the, the attack has come to me every single day since it's happened in one form or another, not necessarily in a, a negative or traumatic way, but I remember it and it's a big part of my, of my consciousness and who I am now. It says plenty about the 31-year-old's commitment to his work that he's able to put all that behind him. He says he goes where he's needed, and at the moment, that's central Niger. We're heading to a village called Dangulbi, which is in the area development project that World Vision runs called Konaka West. OK, and what are you expecting to see? Well, we're going to be visiting a, a health centre where we're carrying out uh, screening and distribution for malnourished children. So we, uh, what I'm going to be looking for is really to see how well the, the program's running, um, how are our staff coping with the, the inflow of women and children, are we, are we getting lots of kids in? Behind this fence is a World Vision health clinic specialising in child malnourishment. People have been arriving here since the early hours of the day. It's about 9.30 now. And over here we've got, well, a parking lot of sorts for those women and children lucky enough to come here on oxen cart. Others have walked long, long distances to get here, and all for the same reason. Many of these women have already been identified as having babies that are malnourished. Lack of food and disease kills one in five children in Niger. You don't have to search very far to find little ones desperately clinging to life. This is little Sadia. She's been brought here by her grandmother. About an hour's walk to get here. Incredibly, she's 19 months old. She looks not much bigger than a newborn, but that's a severe case of malnutrition. Her mother's pregnant, so she hasn't been able to breastfeed and she's also had diarrhoea. Amazingly, she's actually been looked after at this clinic for the last three weeks, so she's had three visits here, but is still severely non-nourished. Sardia's is one of many heartbreaking stories we hear throughout the day as the measuring and recording continues. As difficult as it is to believe, these children are the lucky ones. Really underlines the thin line between life and death in this region, isn't it? Very much so, and it's a very, very vulnerable child. And we use the, the term vulnerability a lot to describe um, people and children specifically who live very close to the edge of survival. And this is a good example. I mean, you know, that little girl could, could die in 24 hours if, if the wrong thing happened to her now. Um, and so she really needs to be looked after. When you're the poorest nation in the world, it doesn't take much to tip the balance. Once again, Niger is in a desperate situation. And once again, it's being largely ignored. 
It can be immensely frustrating and it can be very difficult talking to donors and being told the same message of, oh well we understand that there's a, a crisis, we understand that there are children dying, but actually there's nothing we can do about it right now, our money's tied up somewhere else or we just don't have the resources. And how do you keep going when, when that happens? I mean it must feel completely hopeless. I don't think it's ever completely hopeless. There's always resources coming in and actually probably the, the generosity we, we are, are most touched by is the generosity of the everyday people um, and, and they're the ones that, that enable us to keep our programs running even when a lot of the, the big donors uh, step aside and um, that gives us the ability to keep running and, and also encourages us knowing that there's a, a support base behind us. For those who survive the most vulnerable years of their lives, the challenges are not over. If a child hasn't got a birth certificate, as many don't, they are unable to register for school, unable to better themselves or their communities. For thousands of New Zealand donors, that was unacceptable. And now there's a program to give those previously uneducated children an opportunity. Called the Second Chance School, it's giving kids like 15-year-old Abdul Ackman exactly that, a second chance. So does he enjoy learning? Is he enjoying this opportunity? He said yes, he's very excited that this second chance gave him a, a, a second chance to be in school. Abdul later tells us he wants to be a teacher. Many of the girls here say they're interested in nursing. The, uh, the essence behind the school is it's a catch-up. So normally primary school is six years. Uh, in the second chance schools, kids who've missed out on primary school go through it in four years, so that at the end of four years, they can then step into secondary school and uh, start training for careers that are going to benefit the community, like nursing and teaching, like some of the kids we've just been listening to today. Five years ago, when Tristan Clements ran World Vision's aid program here, he instigated village grain banks like this one. By encouraging families to put aside some of their harvest, they were then able to sell their produce when grain prices rose later in the season, making a profit. The grain banks are awaiting the latest harvest, but they've been empty for some time. They have had a difficult year this year, but in all the other years, they've been uh, making profits, they've been restocking it themselves, and they've been distributing aid themselves to communities and fa uh, families in the community who need assistance. You get the sense things are still being done here, the way they were hundreds, if not thousands of years ago. Millet is still the staple crop, but its preparation is energy sapping and time consuming. Tristan says the best way to combat Niger's food shortages is through diversification, with crops like the cassava root. You find cassava as a bit of a staple in other parts of, of the world and other parts of Africa, um, but we're trying to get it grown here as something to sort of diversify the diet a little bit. And obviously you can eat it raw. You can eat it raw or um, boil it up and um, yeah, it tastes pretty good actually. I'll try some. Thanks. Mm. Yeah, it tastes a bit like pear. Mm. Kind of. Nakwana, <laughs> nakwana. <laughs> if Tristan was feeling any apprehension about returning to Africa after his experience in Darfur, this village in central Nisia would have conquered it. These people have nothing, and yet they're about the friendliest you'll ever meet. Does it make you feel proud of what you've managed to achieve when you come to a place like this? Yeah, absolutely, it does. Um, we, you know, we're doing something that they appreciate. I mean, if, if we were doing things that they didn't like, then you know, we'd get rocks thrown at us when we went past. You know, but you know, we're welcomed here. They enjoy having us here, and um, you know, that's that, that's something that can that can really make you smile. Tristan Clements' photography probably best illustrates the sort of roller coaster ride aid workers go through. Through his lens, you see what he sees every day. Joyous portraits sit next to pictures of despair. But these images can't be tucked away in a photo album. It, it leaves an emotional impact, that's for sure. It's, it's, it, however much you try and uh, buffer yourself, any, any time you see a really sick child, it's, it, there's a sense of helplessness, just looking at the child, and there's a sense of sadness as well that you can't really avoid. 
There's an importance to Tristan's work that most of us will never experience. A bad day at the office can end in death. He's making a difference and says the day he doesn't feel that will be the day he packs up his bags and goes home. Coming up. Can you really make a difference? Mate, we are making a difference, and it's fantastic. That's next on 60 Minutes.